Hey folks, today we have a new leader on the show, but he was a mechanic first, and that is our trending going forward. We're trying to get new me mechanics, new leaders, leaders who were mechanics on the show, and keep it very focused to that so you guys can understand what it's like to be a mechanic for a period of time, learn what skills you need to grow over a period of time to become a leader. This individual has been a um, mechanic for 13 years before being a leader. He's now a service manager at an import store here, and not here, I was going to say here in the U.S. My goodness, I'm Canadian, my God. Um, Willie Carter on the Wrench Turners podcast, a show that's about improving the life, well-being, and productivity mechanics everywhere. Let's get into it right away. Willie, thank you very much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Josh. And it awesome. is, uh, I believe, 18 years as a mechanic before. 18 years. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So we've got we've got lots to dig into today. So one of the one of the big things that came up in some of the comments that to that went direct to my my LinkedIn um, was how diverse it seems to be after a period of time that those who get into the trade and we have folks who were, you know, family had a dealership. That's one. Um, we have folks who had small shops. That's two. Um, we have um, indirect family that worked in shops. What was your introduction? What what got you into becoming a mechanic? Um, so I guess it all started with me um, kind of inheriting a, a vehicle that was not so great. And, uh, you know, this was when I was in high school. Um, the thing was constantly broken down. And, you know, I got tired of paying repair bills, so I started to learn how to fix it myself. Um, from that, I obviously gained interest in the automotive industry um, and then went to a, um, a trade school after high school. Okay, so it, it, it was almost like it was more out of necessity than it was <laughs> yeah, yeah, than it I mean, was it anything. Was... Mm -hmm. It was if you want to get to work or you want to go hang out with your friends, like this is what you've got to do. So you got to get it fixed. What was the what was the car? Uh, it was a ninety five Hyundai Scoop. Hyundai very, Scoop. Yeah, very limited production for good reason. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try. Let's see, folks. Let's see if we can get a picture on the screen here when this goes out. Hyundai Scoop. I don't even think I've ever heard the name Hyundai Scoop. Yeah. I worked on Hyundai's. Hyundai's and Kia's many, many, many years ago when when it was still very much as the definition of what Hyundai and Kia was, where they were throwaway vehicles after like two years. Now, Hyundai, that's in 95. That had to have been nearly a throwaway car, and you were working it on it It wasn't a good hand. year for them, no, no. It wasn't a good year for them. <laughs> it wasn't a good year. What color was it? Uh, it was black. Okay. Um, you know, faded, clear coat, but black. Okay. I think my first car was my my first quasi first car anyway was a 95 Sunfire coupe 5 speed and it was black and it had the old school um go back even farther like early 90s Cavalier uh round 15s and they had it was like one of the first cars I think that had like black painted portions of an aluminum wheel that old and, and it, anyway I love that car. I, I did stupid things in that car. I was absolutely stupid in that car. But we remember those for those very reasons. I mean, maybe that was part of the reason that it was broken all the time. I mean... <laughs> There's the self-accountability right there. Yeah. Maybe I was the reason it was always broken. Right. I'll, I'll own my part, but it, it still wasn't a great car. <laughs> now, that took you into school, and you got through school. What was school like? Um, so school was, um, it was like a two year program. Um, and it was probably about, uh, an hour and 20 minute drive from where I lived. Um, uh, I went to the trade school and then also had a part-time job at a small independent at the same time. So I would go mm -hmm. to the independent in the morning, drive to school, probably get home around, uh, 10 30 at night um get back up again the, the next morning and do the same thing um school was interesting um where i went to school it was a mixture of people who were paying to be there and wanted to learn the automotive industry 
Um, and then people who were on their third strike for the three strike program um, in the juvenile detention centers. So there were definitely some people who just didn't want to be there mm -hmm. and, you know, other people who did want to be there. So it, it was um, very diverse, but uh, at the end of the day, like if you, really want to work at something you're going to get the information that you need and i just kind of you know kept my head down and um persisted through it and um you know never never gave up okay what would you say given the circumstances you know i've not heard of the three strike program before but that's that's a different story what would you say for you was the most challenging part about school was it the fact that you were commuting an hour and 20 minutes each way to school on top of trying to work to pay the bills or, or was some portion of schooling a challenge? Um, I don't think that the actual schooling was, was too much of a challenge. Um, the drive every day was, um, you know, it did kind of wear away after a while. Um, but I think that what kind of, uh, held my attention through it was just being able to go to different, um, classes so you know they had it organized where you would go to like a steering and suspension class for several weeks and then move on to the next class and um you know just the idea that you're not doing the same thing every single day mm -hmm. kind of kept me engaged with that and kept me coming back okay because one of the the challenges that i have at, at school for both the the automotive program that i did many years ago and the motorcycle program that I did only a couple of years ago, not even, not even a couple of years ago is that our here in Ontario, there's, there's two, there's three different ways. You could do a full year round course as a young individual. Most, there isn't too many older individuals going to the school full year round. There is a day release where you go uh, once a week, every week, year round. Uh, for the schooling and then there's block release which is what I did and it's for the automotive program in Ontario it's three sessions of eight weeks um, and it's like nine hours a day for for eight weeks um, the motorcycle program is only two sessions which is a bit asinine uh, to be honest but at the same time in both circumstances it's like 45 minutes to an hour of one, um, of one pro one, not program, but one course. And it's like six, six times a day, like bang, 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 all throughout the day. So you're, you're getting crushed on with all of this new information in theory, um, really complicated, really complex information, but a lot of it is outdated. What would you say your experience now? This is going to go back a while. <laughs> what would you say your experience for course material is um and any and do you have any insight to what it is currently uh as far as course material at that particular school um i do think that some of it was a little dated um one thing that i you know looking back wish that there was a little more of is um like hands-on integration you know they had you would start with uh classwork and kind of go through theory and you know it was boring for a couple of days uh at best so you know you're sitting there just listening to instruction and then they may bring in like a a simulator or something that you can check out um but there was very little actual hands-on like in the shop we would have shop days but they i don't think that there was nearly enough um, actual hands-on a lot of people who um, lean into the automotive industry they are hands-on people to begin with and that's what their focus is on and um, not to generalize but um, I know that myself and several other people that I've spoken with you know they might not be the best test taker because they're not um, so focused on the information that they're given if it's in like a meeting or a classroom setting. But if you do something hands-on, they retain that very well. So um, mm -hmm. I, I definitely think that they were lacking in that department. I think there's uh, something to speak to the fact that many of the instructors 
were in the field like us previously, but it feels like, and, and I don't know this for sure because I, I don't know how how the politics and the bureaucracy and the administration all kind of combine into building course curriculums. But it feels like some of the teachers are very hamstrung on what they can and cannot do in class um, for all kinds of liability reasons and government mandates and so on and so forth. And I'm willing to bet it's different from state to state, province to province, country to country. But knowing that there is a multitude not a multitude, that's the wrong word, but knowing that there is three different learning types, right? You have your auditory, you have your tactile, um, and you have your visual learners. And depending on circumstances, there's a mix of the three based on the individual. So if, if you're an auditory learner and you're um, hands-on heavy without active instruction, they're not going to learn anything. And conversely, as to your point, if you're a heavy tactile learner, you're not going to learn anything if everything is audio. So I think one of the things that is missed, and I think this is missed in the shop as much it is a, as, as much as it is missed in school, is that there's not enough of a mix of the different learning styles. I think the teachers, whilst they may, they may or may not be taught um, how to teach and I think that's one of the biggest challenges that, that may be present. It's not so much necessarily the, the course material, the length, boring, challenging, easy, hard, whatever you want to ca case is, is that we're not necessarily getting the kind of teaching that we need in order to be successful. And I think that that kind of mirrors in the shop. You know, I talk about shop foreman on a regular basis and how important and vital shop foreman to a shop is because they're the teachers, in the shop, right? When, when crisis arises, that's the opportune moment to teach. And if the person learning is an auditory learner and the foreman is only giving them tactile instruction, they're not going to learn. So the mistakes are going to happen again. And conversely, we're talking about auditory, visual, tactile. If they're not capable of teaching anyone, they're not going to be a really great foreman. And I think that goes to the course material at school. If they're not able to teach in all three ways that we that someone is capable of learning they're not going to be a great teacher so we harp on on the course material a lot and i i hear that a lot i myself believe that there's a dead, genuine lack of course material uh, um relevant course material but the teaching i think comes first it needs to improve first and right. i know there's there's some definitely some some of that going on um to that end so when you came out of school and you had the opportunity to do whatever you want with the school. What was your what was your first thought? What, did, what was your first desire to? Um, so I had kind of always been interested in Honda as a brand. Um, at that time, I owned a Honda Civic, and I'd become like very familiar with. Um, again, through breaking it, um, working mm -hmm. on the vehicle, uh, so. I gravitated gravitated towards a uh, like local Honda store. I went and interviewed with them and um, started there as an hourly tech. Um, that I think I'd mentioned before, like my first job there at the Honda store was doing like a heater core in a mm -hmm. Dodge Durango. So it wasn't all that I thought it was going to be at first. But you know, I I was the new guy coming in, and they're like, "Let's see what this guy can do." we've got some work that other people don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I understood that I needed to kind of prove myself and, um, carve my own path there. And, uh, I think that honestly that, uh, resonated with me and I kind of carried that throughout my career. Um, every time that I faced a new challenge, I just kind of remembered like, well, you, you've got to prove yourself and you've got to keep proving yourself. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you are just stagnant and you're a stick in the mud, then you're not, you're not going anywhere. So um, even if you feel like you've done enough, you, you still need to keep pushing forward. hundred mm percent. -hmm. I think that that comes back to one of the things that Brook, Brooklyn said recently and, and Charles Sandville said recently, you know, doing the things that, getting good at doing the things no one else wants to do 
and walking into the dealership and as an hourly tech and wanting to learn and, and grow and being thrust upon uh, with a Dodge Durango as your first major job at a Honda store means that you know you're doing the things that nobody else wants to do and you're and you're learning all of the things that you may not necessarily learn by only working on one brand. Right. Now, one of the cool things in going back to my own uh, apprenticeship, we did all kinds. Of the the five of us, five apprentices, we regularly did stuff that had nothing to do with Dodge. We're at a big Dodge store and we're doing. <laughs> We're working on tractors. We're working on bulldozers. We're working on all of the used cars that would come in. The used cars that were going to go to auction, the shop foreman would bring us and say, hey, this has got every light on the dash. Figure out what's wrong with it. And we'd have to figure out. It's it's one thing when a check engine light comes to you, you know, even 10 years in, and it's a challenging check engine light that you got to figure out. It's a completely different story when, when the vehicle's 15 years old and it's got literally every light on on the dash. And you have to figure out everything. And, you know, those are the things that teach us new processes and what do we need to do in order to get to, you know, what's the, what's my phrase my grandfather said, get good, then you get fast. You know, you got to figure out how to get good at, at doing the basics first, so that then you can build upon those and you can get fast at doing the really hard stuff. So that takes the next step. So it sounds like your first year at, you know, working at a Honda store wasn't necessarily easy because you got some challenging stuff other than that Durango heater core. What, what was your first year like? Um, I think because I took on that job and several other ones, it, it allowed me to gain some respect from the techs that were there. I know that, you know, coming in as someone new to a dealership, especially someone younger, um, you know, you kind of have to, to prove yourself to, um, to fit in, um, there were several newer people around the same time that were just like, well, I'm not going to, not going to mess with that. It's not my job. And you could see that they were kind of singled out. And I was like, okay, well, I'm really glad that I did choose this path because now, you know, these guys are coming to me for help. Hey, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? And through that, I'm, I'm able to learn at a faster pace, um, being able to assist some of the, the main shop techs, um, also build some friendships and relationships with them. Uh, I think my first year there um, went really well. Um, I think uh, after trying to remember exactly, it was maybe a year or a year and a half as an hourly tech. And then I moved into a flat rate position, um, which, you know, felt like, okay, well, I did the right thing. Okay. Okay. Good. The, the the fact that people were coming to you after a short period of time kind of showcases your desire to learn, your capability to execute. You know, when when you're a young individual, it's a really great way to boost your ego and your confidence when people start to come to you for, for help. So taking that into consideration, you've got a couple of years under your belt in a school, a year or a year or two under your belt on the floor. What's... What happened between then and and the time where you it was an opportunity for you to step up to leadership? What happened in between there? What are what are some of the things that you can you can teach us about either the things that you learned or some challenges that you had to overcome that that put you in a position where you wanted to become a leader? Um, obviously, my first Honda store. I I'm still fresh and new and not really. Um, I didn't have leadership in my sights at that time. Um, I did grow to a point there where, um, you know, I've done all the work. I, I want to go to the training center. I want to evolve as a technician. And I kind of got roadblocked there. And um, I went with it for a while, ended up um, moving to another Honda store that had said, hey, if you want to go to training, we'll send you every time it's available. Mm -hmm. So uh, I made that move, and when I went to that store, the first thing that I told the service manager is, I want all of the jobs that no one else wants to do. Just give them to me. I want to learn. I want to grow. You guys are going to benefit from it, and I'm going to benefit from it. So um, we had a single dispatcher for the entire shop, and he would literally bring me things that no one else wanted to do, you know. This guy had this car, you know, three times, can't figure it out. Um, 
you know, at, at this point, I'm like maybe five years in, into the industry and they're bringing me stuff that, you know, the master techs don't want to look at. And it may have taken me a little longer than some of those guys, but I was learning through that process. And that, um, to me, that's invaluable. I mean, to be able to, uh, to take those jobs and learn from them and, uh, then be able to get faster and faster at doing them, uh, through doing that, I, um, after about a year of going to the training center, I became a Honda master tech and then became a group leader at that store. So it was kind of, um, was that more because of your capabilities as a mechanic or the fact that people were starting to follow your lead? I think both. Um, I think that, you know, their people were kind of relying on me and they saw, okay, well, you know, this guy can, can help and he can, um, lead. And so I became a group leader there. We had like three person teams and, um, I built a really great team in the shop. And then I went to the GM and asked, Hey, can I just, can I be the shop foreman over everyone? I want to be able to help everyone, not just the guys on my group. Uh -huh. Um, kind of brick walled there. They'd never had a shop foreman before. Didn't like the idea of doing it. Um, and that's when I moved on to the current dealership that I'm at. Uh -huh. Um, I started there as a, an a tech within probably a year moved into a group leader position. Um, two or three years later into the shop foreman role. Mm -hmm. Um, this is the biggest Honda store that I've worked at. Um, yeah, definitely the biggest Honda store that I've worked at as well. So we probably at the time had 25 technicians, um, definitely needed a shop foreman, especially with the evolving, um, technology and, um, you know, issues arising. So from there, you know, I just tried to, uh, take on as much as I could for everyone, help everyone out. Um, I kind of just became the go-to guy and I'm not sure if you're familiar with Honda's, uh, most system, but they had a ton of issues when they came out with that. And I sort of became the, um, unofficial expert of the most system through mm -hmm. dealing with it so many times. So, um, we would, uh, they would regularly just give all of those jobs to me. Uh, I also developed a pretty good relationship with our Honda field engineer through that. Um, I missed in that process also, um, became a Honda super tech. Um, Oh, nice. Just before coming to my current dealer. Um, I was recommended by the, uh, district service parts and service manager. Um, mm -hmm as well as my service manager. Uh, it was a treat sure talk to Brooklyn about it, but you know, there's like an entrance exam and then an interview. Um, mm -hmm. so I went through that whole process and, um, gained a lot more contacts and a lot more friends through that. Um, they sort of, um, get everyone together every year and, you know, you'll tour a Honda facility or, um, one year we visited like the tech line facility out in California gives you a lot more insight as to, um, how things are and, and why they are the way that they are. And scope, right? Cause sometimes yeah. we don't necessarily understand the, the scope of the things that we have to deal with. Like just, just as a, a point of, of note here in Canada, we're roughly a 10th of the size in terms of population to the U S give or take. And, most of the market penetration of the vehicles in, in terms of brand is pretty much the same. But when you have a tenth of the size in terms of population also means all of your volume by brand goes down. So I, I ran a, a small Mitsu store for a while and I got the opportunity to, to go to different things at the Mitsubishi. You know, we went to the warehouse and, you know, we went to head office and so forth and as someone who also did those kinds of things for Dodge years prior, the scope and scale between Dodge in Canada and Mitsubishi in Canada is staggering, where 
um, here in Canada, you know, the Dodge facility is a block. It's a block. The Mitsu facility is a building. And you can walk the building in about five minutes and you can shake the hand of every single person that's in there, including all the people at TechLine. So when you, as an individual, were in the U.S., even Mitsubishi has a block, but that'll be for all of the U.S. Whereas Honda will have, if I'm not mistaken, they have four across the continental U.S., something of that nature. I think there's four facilities yeah. across the U.S. that are like an entire block. So when you call in a tech line, there might be a hundred different people across the country that you're potentially talking to, whereas here in Canada, there might be two. Right. You, you get to know the, the difference in scale between the two. So it also takes into account things like you putting into perspective when you call into tech line, there are you know, 17,000 dealerships across U.S., new automotive dealerships. There's roughly 17,000 or something like that. And you think you're working at a Honda store. I think there's, what, 3,000 stores, something like that? Somewhere right around there, yeah. Yeah, somewhere around 3,000 stores, which means there is approximately, you know, 30,000 Honda technicians in the U.S. And if 1% of those are calling into tech line for something on a infrequent basis. 1% of 30,000 is still 300 every single day. So when you call in to wait and you call into tech line, it's like, Oh, they're on the, I'm on hold again. <laughs> that context now matters. And as somebody who's experienced it, you can go, okay, folks, tech line is busy. They're, they're busy. They're not just putting you on hold because they don't want to work or anything nonsensical like that. Like, we get upset. We're frustrated. We're calling in for a car, whatever, whatever, whatever. They're busy. Give them a break. They're busy. They're doing the best they possibly can. So that context really is helpful. And and, the, and you were able to get your Honda Super Tech? Yep. Awesome. That's awesome. That's a really big achievement, if I understand correctly, for Honda. That's a really big achievement. It is. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so that, I think... That um carried into what you're doing now, right? Yes. Um, I think as far as perspective as well, something that, um, a lot of the techs may perceive is, uh, when they call tech line, you know, they wonder like, well, what's this person's background? Like, did, did they ever work in a shop? Um, mm -hmm. and we got to do some one-on-one, -on -one, um, meetings with some of the tech line reps. And I can assure you that they are all qualified. Um, mm -hmm. so that, that made me feel a lot better about, um, some of the interactions that uh, people had talked about in the past. Um, and they're all super nice guys. So yeah, that was I, a really cool experience. That's awesome. That's awesome. So what would you say as part of that, that process? So you had to grind, right? Years of grinding on the shop, learning, literally doing all of the jobs that nobody else wanted to do, making a living, doing the jobs that nobody else wanted to do and getting good at them. And one of the things that, I want to make sure that we highlight before we, we go into the next step is the, the phrase, the more you learn, the less you earn comes up on a regular basis. And one of the challenges with that from the negative connotation of that is that you're not taking into account all the things that you get better at by doing the really hard stuff. And it's, it's a really undervalued piece by a lot of people, service managers, technicians alike. And when you have a technician who wants the hard things, making the sacrifice on making a little less money so they can learn more should be also rewarded to some capacity. Because in five years, you're not going to see the direct benefit in six months. It's something you're going to see in the benefit like three years down the road, five years down the road, 10 years down the road. Because what you've done for yourself over your career is all, by always taking on the really hard challenges, by, by doing the things nobody else wants to do, you put yourself in a position where you know so much that even the things that most people would say is a challenge is easy for you, which allows you to take on the weight of leadership significantly more easily because you've done the Christmas tree dash. You've done the, the, the repairs that no one else around not only were able to figure out, but want to figure out. 
those are the kinds of people that we want leading, not because they're exemplary diagnosticians, but because the, the mindset is, I'm willing to sacrifice all of the hardship that is required to get to a point to help the entire team succeed. That is leadership. And one of the things that technicians who want to become leaders don't understand is it's not simply necessarily the people that can produce that become leaders, because we do need people who know how to produce in leadership roles. We need people who know how to produce even when it's really, really, really hard. That's the key. Yeah. It just go, oh, well, you know, what's the phrase that was said to recently? COVID managers. These are functionally people who began in the industry when, yes, they were, they were slightly more difficult than I'm going to describe. It was order taking. They were salespeople or service people who were order taking through COVID. And then because they were successful at that, at managing relationships to a degree through that, not really any major challenges other than relationship building. Now they're managing people who only took orders. So now that we're in a, in a, in a phrase where what did, what did, um, Sean Wells said it, I think today, even this morning, maybe, uh, the car biz is back because now you have to sell. There's, you now have to objection handle. You now have to go, Hey, this is the value that you're getting by coming to this dealership for this in our service department. This is the value of doing this. It's not just a, Hey, take it or leave because there's nowhere else to go. It's no longer that they now have to sell. Now you have to fix everything because there are things coming back to the dealership or to the independents. If you're listening, there's things coming back because now people feel safe enough to do so. You've got an onslaught of stuff that hasn't been at the dealership or at the independent to fix. So we need people capable of dealing with the really, really hard stuff and doing the customer service and being able to produce all at the same time. So learn the hard stuff if you want to become a leader. So uh, I, I really appreciate the story because, you know, it's it's really what we need to, to I don't necessarily memorialize, maybe the wrong word, but we need to, to define as the things that we need to learn to become a leader. And that takes me into the last little bit here. What would be your one piece of advice given your career? What would be your one piece of advice for a mechanic to be happier, healthier, more productive tomorrow? Um. I would say it's exactly the theme of this. I mean, just just work at it. Um, if you are a tech in the industry right now and you're trying to figure out what the next thing is for you, go to your service manager and say, I want all the hard work. I want to do it. Um, going and asking for more money and not having the uh, the skill or the experience to back it up, you know, anyone can do that. But if you go and... You let them know, hey, I'm I'm here for the long haul. I want to help you guys. I want to help myself. Go ask for all, all that work that no one else wants to do and get good at it. Because when I started doing that, yeah, there were struggles. Um, but probably two to three years in, I was still handling all of that work and, and outputting 70 to 80 hours a week. So once you get comfortable in the uncomfortable... There's no stopping you. I mean, you'll you'll just keep skyrocketing. That's that's the bar right there. Get comfortable when you're uncomfortable. That right there is is the tidbit I think folks need to to learn right there. That's the piece. Because you're going to learn all kinds of really gnarly stuff. Oh, I'm never going to need to know this again. Well, guess what? It's the foundational stuff that you need to know for the next job. And then it becomes a foundational knowledge that you need for the next job and then the next job and then the next job. That's awesome. That's really awesome. I appreciate that very much. Well, Willie, it's been a pleasure. I appreciate you giving us some time. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on, Josh. You're Thanks for doing welcome. what you do. I, I'm hey, as much as like I said, the whole reason why this has started in the first place is to, to give back to the community that's provided me with 20 plus years. So if I can if I can continue to do this and and continue to provide value, I'm going to continue to do so because a I love doing this. I love meeting people like you, and and b if I can find one little nugget to help one person every time that they listen, that's that's what yeah that's a win. Happen. Exactly, exactly. So folks, I think that's the end of another episode. Uh, I appreciate you all. 
like there's a lot of you listening and watching now. I really appreciate all of you. So continue to do so. I hope you are enjoying. I hope you are subscribed. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. And as we end the show, as we always do with a quote this time around, this one's a little bit interesting. And I thought it was uh, appropriate given the fact we're getting into fall because we get into uh, the lack of, of uh, the big old flaming ball in the sky it seems to be shrinking in number of hours in a day. We got to think about that. Just remember that keep your face always towards the sunshine and the shadows will fall behind you. Walt Whitman. Folks, remember negative pushes, positive pulls, and always clean your toys before you put them away.